Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to our Digital Scholar webinar hosted by the Southern California Clinical and Translational Science Institute or the SCCTSI uh, at the University of Southern California and Children's Hospital LA. My name is Eric Peterson. I am the co-director of Digital Recruitment and Scholarship at the CTSI. I'm also an associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences within the uh, school, the University of Southern California. So by now, most people are familiar with Zoom, but the way we're gonna do the webinar today is we'll hold questions until the end, but I would uh, highly encourage you to ask questions in the chat as they come up. So what I'll do is I will take the questions that you put in the Q&A or into the chat feature. And then uh, once the speaker is finished with the talk, uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end there that I'll facilitate. So we're very excited today to host Raymond Luong. Uh, who's going to be talking about recruiting research participants online using Reddit. And this is a topic that I think is going to be really interesting to our uh, digital scholars. Um, so Mr. Luang, he's a PhD student in experimental psychology uh, at, the McGill, at McGill University, which is Montreal, and he specializes in quantitative psychology and modeling. Um, and so he's done some of this work where he's actually recruited from Amazon's MTurk as well as from Reddit's R sample size. And he's going to share some of those experiences with us. Um, but just some really neat stuff about uh, his background. He's, he's aiming to bridge communication gaps between methodologists like himself and substantive researchers on issues, um, which is really uh, something that's way, uh, that's completely up our alley with this digital webinar series. Um, he's also very interested in teaching. So he aspires to increase the psychological literacy of the public, improve statistics introductions in psychology and increase the accessibility of undergraduate research experiences. So hopefully we've got some undergrads on the call today as well as grad students and uh, upper level people as well. And um, with that, I will now turn it over to Raymond Luang. Okay. Uh, yep. Everyone see the uh, PowerPoint. Okay. Looks good. Awesome. Uh, so Eric, uh, thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction. Uh, so uh, as you said, uh, my name is Raymond. I'm here to talk about my experiences using uh, R sample size. It's kind of mouthy to keep saying R sample size or R slash. So I'll just refer to it as a uh, sample size from uh, here on forward. So I really do also hope there's some grad students or undergrads uh, on this call as well, as uh, you'll hear from me during kind of the history of how I got into this, that uh, the undergrad experience, research experience is really what got me into looking into this. Uh, so first off, uh, I want to get into uh, a roadmap of just like what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, you've seen the kind of goals that there are for this session. Uh, for today, I'll be talking about, uh, first off, I'll start with a primer on just like online data collection in general. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, I'll, uh, in, an introduction to what sample size really is and some of the best practices that I've learned from my experiences on how to collect data on it. Uh, I'll give a very brief uh, introduction to uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, also known as uh, MTurk. Uh, then I'll make a comparison of sample size and MTurk as participant pools for recruiting participants in research. And I'll finish off by talking about some uh, kind of like a brief overview of like 2021 type current issues and uh, limitations surrounding using sample size in MTurk for uh, psychological research. So uh, before I begin, I also wanted to say that all the references and links that in this webinar are on this uh, link here. So you don't need to like frantically uh, try to scribble down any references and try to find something obscure on Google. I know. Uh, uh, how that is. And uh, I believe the slides will be uh, provided after the webinar as well. Uh, as well, uh, just to help facilitate any questions you might have during this webinar, uh, please note that there are little slide numbers like at the bottom corner of, the, uh, of every uh, slide. So if you have any specific questions about a certain topic, uh, you can note down the slide number and be easier to uh, uh, go back and reference whatever you have a question about. Okay, so uh, just as a very brief primer about online recruitment uh, for research, uh, many of us may be familiar, but for those of us who aren't, uh, the very typical uh, samples that are used in psychological research are infamously the undergraduate samples, uh, uh, undergraduate first year psychology students that are uh, recruited for uh, research studies. And these have been uh, very widely criticized for their lack of demographic diversity and representativeness compared to other um, uh, populations and online recruitment uh, propose some kind of advantage to uh, to address this kind of limitation. 
Uh, one of the key kind of advantages besides the demographic diversity and uh, potentially data quality is that there's more flexibility to, uh, to do with online uh, manners of recruiting for research. A uh, very timely uh, example of this would be global pandemics like the one we're experiencing right now. Uh, I'm sure if you are a student or uh, a PI, you've experienced a transition from recruiting students or participants in person to uh, online formats, even the undergraduate uh, pools. Uh, have flexibility uh, in this regard. And uh, online recruitment for research, many of us have heard about the uh, paid for options, but what I wanna talk about and emphasize today are the unpaid um, options. So the most popular and well-known paid options would be uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. And what I'm gonna be talking about today would be uh, Reddit sample size. So, uh, how I got into this project originally was a, a motivation from my undergrad. So uh, you might notice already that this photo is a little bit, uh, a little bit outdated. And this uh, photo is actually a conference from when I was still uh, in undergrad. And at the time, I was very plucky. I wanted to get a lot of uh, research experience early on. And uh, the problem was that uh, my institution that I was going to at the time didn't give me access to uh, any of the undergraduate pools, or uh, and I didn't have any funding. Of course, I wasn't working with any professor, uh, and me wanting to do some kind of research, I was looking into options of how would I be able to uh, collect data from participants. And uh, I had some skepticism towards the like snowball sampling styles of like posting surveys on Facebook. I'm sure many of you have seen, uh, seen those from friends or colleagues before. Uh, and I was kind of was and still am a Redditor. I'm more of a lurker if anything, but uh, I was a Redditor and uh, sample size was something that happened to come to my attention through, uh, through that. And I was really interested in seeing, okay, whether or not this would be uh, a viable thing. It's participants who are being uh, participants who are volunteering for surveys, and that'd be perfect for me. I don't have any, I don't have any money. I don't have any funding, and uh, that'd be a good basis for uh, first project. And ultimately, this served as a kind of proof of concept for using um, Reddit because I've talked to some friends, I've, uh, I've asked some professors. I was not familiar with anyone who ever really used uh, Reddit for. Uh, like Reddit specifically to collect data from participants or uh, in like actual uh, publications. So I was hoping that in my attempt to do this, that it'd be a sort of like proof of concept that sample size can be a legitimate way of collecting data for participants for legitimate uh, psychological research. You can actually see in the background over here of the uh, uh, my photo, my very outdated photo that uh, this poster was actually my very first uh, research project, and it was exactly using the sample size participant pool using the uh, old uh, Reddit logo. So uh, that is exactly what we're going to be talking about today. The main topic is sample size. What is sample size? Oh, what is it about? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm assuming that some of you are familiar with what Reddit is. If you aren't, Reddit it can be summarized as kind of social media news aggregation uh, kind of website. Uh, people can, anon uh, can sign up and anonymously make posts about pretty much whatever they want. Reddit is uh, uh, separated into different communities, what called subreddits, which uh, uh, cover different kinds of topics. One of these Reddit uh, communities uh, or subreddits is r slash sample size. And sample size is a Reddit community with uh, over 171,000 different volunteers Basically, they're just people who want to uh, volunteer to complete uh, research studies. And in this uh, Reddit community, what happens is that people post their own studies. So researchers or uh, researchers or just people who want to post casual stuff, uh, they'll make a post in this subreddit and then uh, people can click the links and then complete the studies. Uh, in this community, compensation is optional. So people here are genuine volunteers or not. Uh, uh, there isn't any necessity for being compensated for doing what they want to do. And if you want to offer compensation, it's flexible. So it's not necessarily like a pay uh, as you go kind of uh, pay once it's completed kind of thing. Uh, a, a very popular uh, compensation option on sample size is using gift cards. Uh, one of the unique things about sample size, uh, just due to how it works and how it's uh, centered on a, uh, a Reddit community, is that the, uh, the manner in which studies are advertised or posted it's moderated. So each uh, individual Reddit community has uh, moderators in their communities and sample size is no exception. 
And it has several rules in place to ensure that there's fairness and that uh, researchers have researchers and casual people like have an opportunity to have exposure to their study so that people can complete it. And sample size is really designed for short surveys, simple experiments, and as uh, my experience will inform, uh, course projects. Uh, part of the reason is because uh, these are purely volunteers, people who are uh, taking time of their uh, taking their own time to complete studies just out of their own interest. And attrition rates for uh, these kinds of volunteers, especially when there's no compensation can be very high. So what does sample size exactly look like? You can Google it right now on the like on another tab or something, I won't know, of course. Uh, this is pretty much what it looks like. This is a snapshot, I think as early as yesterday. If you look it up today, it'll probably be different because the studies are changing uh, constantly. Uh, we can see here that each of these individual posts represents a different study that someone wanted to post. And as I said before, it isn't uh, necessarily restricted to just academic researchers. For example, this one, you can see a little tag here that says uh, marketing. So this one is a, a marketing directed uh, study. The next one here, uh, the tag says casual. So this one isn't academic or marketing. It's not, even, it's not a like a serious thing. It's just something that someone's interested in having people uh, reply to. And then finally, what we are interested in this, uh, this webinar today is the academic type uh, studies here. So here there's an academic tag. Uh, and this tag is, uh, it could be a study done for coursework. It could be a study done for a publication. Uh, but the point is that it's an academic research study. So how, does, uh, how do you actually do anything on sample size? Like how does it work? So the first thing is that uh, it's actually pretty simple. <laughs> the first thing you need to do is create a Reddit account and this is free. The second thing you need to do once you have a Reddit account is you, uh, you have to have a pre-prepared study link. So there is no kind of format or uh, platform on Reddit itself to facilitate any kind of uh, questionnaire beyond very simple polls. It's uh, if you have a study that you need to run, you need to have uh, a separate kind of survey software, for example, Qualtrics, you'll have a Qualtrics link for your survey. And what you do is you prepare a post on this community on sample size. And then that's it. You just uh, post the study and then it'll, uh, it'll stay there. And you can repeat this process every 24 hours as per the rules as, uh, as needed. It really is that simple. So I can show you just a couple snippets of the process. Uh, signing up on Reddit, uh, I know it might seem very simple, but just, just to be clear, to sign up, you can go through Google or Apple or provide an email. You just need to pick a username and password, confirm the email afterwards. And then once you've signed up, you're able to uh, navigate to the sample size community. So making a post itself is also very simple. Here, if you have a, a kind of description for your study, you can just fill in the, uh, the text and the text option here below, provide a title as you saw before. Uh, if you have a link for your study that you'd like to provide instead, then you can do that just by clicking the link section, providing again the title and the URL to your survey. And that's it. Once you've made the post, it's just up, up on the sample size community and it'll stay there. Uh, it'll stay there until your next repost. And then uh, that's the process. So there are specifics that have to do with posting the actual uh, study links. So if we see here on uh, one of my studies that I ran, my very first study uh, ever, but also my first study on uh, sample size, uh, there are very strict rules on how you're supposed to be advertising your studies. So we see here that uh, first off, if we break down the title of how the format of the post works, first we have, uh, uh, it's designated as academic. So because it's a research study, we're designated as academic. Uh, next is the actual title of the study. I titled mine Psychology of Perception. Uh, and then after that, in uh, brackets would be your intended demographic. So you have to target, you have to be clear about what kind of demographic you're looking for to recruit uh, for your study. In this case, I just wanted people who are adults who are 18 plus fluent in English. And this is an optional thing, but I would suggest it is to provide the actual timing for how long your uh, study will take. In this case, I had five to 10 minutes. And then you can see here that the study link is also embedded with the uh, Reddit post. So this is an example of just if you have no description for your study and you just want to provide the information and a link. If you have a study description, then it would look something like, uh, well, before that, uh, 
as I said before, once we have a certain Reddit posts, then we would have a reposting procedure. And you can see here that my repost, uh, the repost is the exact same thing. It's just with the real repost uh, tag. So uh, if we wanted an actual description to go along with our um, uh, study, not only just the link, then what we can do is, as we saw before, just enter the text instead of just entering a link. And then here, this was the second example in the main study that we'll be discussing today. Uh, why do you use our sample size? You can see the same format with the tags, with the audience, and with the uh, duration. And this is the exact, this is actually the exact post that I used uh, backwards as an undergrad on how to collect data uh, from this study. So uh, I've gone through a very basic overview of how exactly uh, our sample size uh, works. And I'd be happy to discuss some of the kind of practices I learned when I was going through the process. I'm happy to admit any, I'm very transparent in that I made mistakes in this process and it wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't a totally clear cut uh, procedure, but I'm happy if uh, this is beneficial for uh, for you when you're, if you decide to use this. The very first thing is that the rules are very, uh, they are monitored properly, which is a very good thing for this uh, community. Particularly the 24 hour rule. I didn't deliberately uh, violate this rule. Uh, you'd wait 24 hours, but sometimes there'd be like a mismatch. For example, uh, if you post it, if you put, uh, make a Reddit post at 9 a.m. and then you make a post at like 8.55 or something that technically counts as like 23 hours, 55 minutes, that sort of thing. Uh, even though that uh, these, these differences may seem minor, uh, the, the community and the website is monitoring uh, users who are making posts on sample size. And one of the things that happened, this only happened once, but this was early on when I wasn't carefully monitoring like the times I was posting the uh, studies is that they would just suspend you. So you're not able to make any posts for the next, um, you're just not able to make any posts for the next three days or so. So that would be an interruption to your, uh, to the data collection. So uh, that's one thing that I, I would very much emphasize is that even though it's very, it seems very straightforward, very simple to just make posts on Reddit and then advertise your studies, you need to pay very careful attention to this 24 hour rule or otherwise you may be picked up by uh, the moderators or, or, uh, or by the like uh, algorithms on Reddit as like a spammer. And of course, uh, this is a community of volunteers who are completing studies for you. So you don't want to be uh, spamming this community. You can be patient with, uh, your recruitment. There are many, many, many other researchers who are also hoping to uh, recruit from this uh, participant pool. Uh, one thing I did find as well, and what uh, Shats 2016, uh, they discuss for Reddit recruitment in general, is that daytime posting from about 9 to 5 p.m. is usually a good uh, guideline for a time to decide when you want to uh, post on Reddit. So the next thing is that yeah, the next thing that I wanted to say is that you want to post studies that are short and simple here. So 20 minutes or less. I alluded to this earlier. And as I said before, there are high attrition rates and just, uh, yeah, just high attrition rates in general for uh, volunteers who are not motivated by any kind of uh, compensation. I don't think it's appropriate to be posting like a 40 minute giant questionnaire on, uh, on this community, try, trying to extract all the information possible. You probably will not get very high recruitment rates and it won't be very, the community just won't be very receptive to these kinds of uh, to these kinds of studies. Uh, one of the other things that uh, I think is important to keep in mind as well is the actual the practical implications of the studies that you're putting on. So I don't know if it's very common practice for undergraduates uh, these days when they're designing uh, consent forms or otherwise, but I think it should be in that uh, you have to design these things to be readable. And coincidentally, the very first study I was using also used readability indices for other things. And I suggest using these when you're designing like the descriptions of your studies, the consent forms. I think this is just a common courtesy that we can do for uh, volunteers on this community. And uh, presumably it can increase your uh, recruitment rates just because if it's a more accessible study, right? Uh, one other suggestion I would make, similar to all these, uh, similar to this advice is to avoid clumping long questionnaires. So we do have like, uh, we're familiar with a lot of questionnaires that have like 50 items or something. You don't want to clump all 50 of those items on one page, for example. We have to keep in mind some of the practical implications. The first thing being that people here are volunteers and they might be on their phone or on a tablet or something. Uh, the format on how surveys work when you're doing uh, like giant questionnaires, they might not even be able to read uh, 
your questionnaire when you're going on it, it'll just exit off and do something else. That's one thing. And the other thing is, it, again, it has to do with the courtesy to uh, uh, the volunteers and attrition rates that it just isn't ideal. You want to uh, make optimal uh, questionnaire designs. Uh, and I think one of the most important uh, tips I can give you is that you can be responsive here. You have to be responsive on, uh, on sample size. I think unlike uh, very traditional methods of data collection, like through undergraduates, uh, oftentimes there isn't much of a follow-up beyond like a debriefing session at the end of the period, uh, at the end of the experiment. But here, uh, people can and they will actively respond to like interesting uh, studies that are posted on sample size. And one of the things that I discovered very early on is that they can identify like technical issues for you. Like they'll be very clear about this. And if you're just posting things and just logging off of uh, the website for a day and just not attending to any of this, you won't be able to notice any of these things or receive any of the feedback that you're receiving from this community. That's one of the unique things about uh, posting on a community like sample size is that you can receive feedback uh, on, uh, on the study or experiment that you're administering. So uh, one thing, uh, one other thing I did want to say, kind of like as an FYI, but not as like a focus of what we'll be talking about today, is that although uh, I've been talking about sample size in general, which is like a subreddit focused specifically on collecting data, which is very unique, uh, you can uh, other uh, researchers have used other subreddits before to recruit uh, participants. For example, uh, yeah, for uh, if you have permission for moderators uh, of those communities, some of them will allow you to post surveys to their communities. Uh, again, Shats 2016 gives more tips on general guidelines uh, for data collection, like on Reddit in general, uh, not specifically sample size. Uh, I strongly suggest that you actually ask these moderators for permission. Suppose you're interested in uh, like opinions from like uh, women specifically, and you want to look for a women uh, directed subreddit. You want to be contacting these moderators before you post something. It's not like sample size where you can just post something. Uh, you'd be asking to be like banned or having your post instantly deleted if you're not asking as these posts, uh, as these uh, communities often get a lot of spam as well. So one example that I go on very uh, a lot personally is the grad school subreddit. And here, this is an example of someone who post had a survey for presumably their own uh, research study. And the studies I'm aware on grad school do go through the uh, moderators, I believe. So they have to request the moderators for access to post these surveys. But I just want, even though this uh, will be about sample size, I just want to give an FYI that it is possible to contact other red communities, but you have to go through their own specific procedures and contacting their uh, moderators. So that's a brief of how sample size works. And I just want to give also a very brief introduction to how Amazon Mechanical Turk works, the most, uh, one of the most popular uh, online data collection platforms in psych research and research in general. Uh, the reason why this has to be, uh, I think it should be brief is because there actually are uh, existing um, webinars on MTurk actually available in the library already. And they cover a lot of uh, ground. I, and in the last few years, there has been, uh, for the most part, over, uh, a lot of overlap with how uh, things work. And I'll, give, I'll be giving some perspective of like modern issues that have come up. But for the most part, these uh, webinars searched here, if you just search MTurk, uh, these ones provide a good overview of how MTurk works uh, already. So uh, I assume some of you have knowledge of what Amazon Mechanical Turk is, but if you don't, I can give a very brief uh, introduction to Amazon Mechanical Turk. So MTurk uh, for short is, you can consider it a general crowdsourcing uh, marketplace. The idea is that people can do, uh, if you need some kind of task done online, uh, you can post it on this, on MTurk, and then people from all around the world who are registered on MTurk will complete it for you. Uh, these tasks, they call them human intelligence tasks or HITs. The very fundamental thing here is that uh, or the minimum requirement for what a hit is, is basically you have a question that needs to be answered, a task that needs to be uh, completed. And of course, a research, sur uh, research survey counts as a type of hit. So uh, MTurk, uh, the, this little picture here, the, the reason why uh, uh, MTurk is named after it is, is because uh, I believe this is the actual mechanical Turk from the 1700s or so. It's a, it was a chess machine, basically, that was uh, purported to be like an autom an automation, so it could automatically uh, play chess and beat people. But uh, 
uh, unbeknownst to others, there's actually a chess master, like a human being in, hit, like hidden inside this machine and doing uh, and actually playing the chess. Analogously, Amazon Mechanical Turk on a digital platform, if we have tasks that need to be uh, completed, we have uh, humans completing it on this marketplace. So MTurk, uh, again, being a crowdsourcing marketplace, you can filter uh, the people that you like to complete your tasks for some kind of fee. And MTurk has been used for a variety of behavioral experiments and, and surveys uh, for the last decade or so. It's been extremely popular. So this is just a look, just a, in, uh, the photo that MTurk actually provided on what MTurk would actually look like here. You have the name of the person or name of the uh, requester that is asking for this task to be completed, the actual title of whatever the task is, the, and the compensation that you would be uh, receiving for this. So the MTurk procedure is uh, also quite straightforward. First off, you have to create an amazon.com account as a requester. Uh, the second thing is that you have to purchase prepayment to be able to compensate participants before you're able to post any kinds of uh, uh, tasks. Then you would create a task and then you have to link the MTurk uh, information with your actual separate survey link. There is a platform on MTurk to create a link, but on uh, most uh, decide to use like, like on sample size, like a separate link like Qualtrics. And you have to have a, a procedure to be able to link the information on MTurk, like this person completed this task with the survey, like they actually completed the survey. Then you as the researcher would have to review and approve or decline any of the worker responses and then repeat this process as uh, necessary. So I actually have a picture of the exact uh, survey that I used on MTurk right here uh, for the uh, study we'll be discussing today. So here we have the study description. So very similar to what we saw on Reddit before. And then uh, we have the survey link. And then we have providing a, again, that link between the questionnaire and the MTurk workers is the survey code. I'm sure this is uh, quite familiar to a lot of you. And this is covered in much greater detail in the uh, uh, other talks provided in the webinars, but I want to give a kind of brief overview to contextualize what we're talking about. So uh, as a kind of 2021 modern-ish FYI, uh, MTurk isn't the only way that you can, MTurk, doing MTurk alone isn't the only way that uh, things are done. One thing that's come into, one additional resource that's come into popularity is called cloud research. People who've used this in the past know it as Turk Prime, and it's basically a package of MTurk add-ons that help researchers, uh, like facilitate researchers doing research on, uh, on MTurk. So one of the things they call is an MTurk toolkit. So it's a simplified interface of how to find, uh, a simplified inf interface to help assist with MTurk, uh, including like timing for uh, releasing certain tasks. There's other features in there. Prime Panels is a specific, um, a specific participant pool to cloud research, which they propose serves uh, uh, several advantages over the original um, MTurk pool. Manage research is essentially uh, outsourcing the management of your project to someone at cloud research. And Sentry is a, an, uh, a data analysis algorithm that helps them detect whether, uh, detect like proper versus improper responses, like fraudulent responses. So uh, they also host an innovations and online research conference uh, research conference that's actually coming up. Complete disclaimer that I was invited to this, but I'm not sponsored or paid or anything by this, uh, by cloud research. But I found that in their descriptions of the abstracts and talks that they have a lot of relevant talks uh, about MTurk and online data, data collection in general. So uh, if you're interested in any of what was discussed here, uh, I encourage you to go to cloudresearch.com to take a look. The other FYI I wanted to give is that there, are all, uh, there have since been alternatives to MTurk as well. So Prolific Academic, now known as Prolific, is a panel that was specifically designed to do academic research. So here they, uh, they, have a, uh, they had a specific manuscript uh, dedicated to uh, analyzing the data quality of Prolific compared to MTurk. They found favorable results. If you're interested in that, uh, you can look at the uh, references with, for Pierre Tall 2017 and visit uh, prolific.co to uh, learn more information. Again, not sponsored, just something that I thought was important to mention in like the modern era of MTurk. So the main juice of what I wanted to talk about today is sample size a viable participant pool for collecting data. So as you can imagine, I had never heard of anyone who used this before for previous research. And when I did a literature review as like a plucky undergrad, I found very few studies. 
But of the studies that did exist, uh, they reported more diverse ages, education, and equal gender, rep uh, gender representation to traditional samples. You might be familiar with the classic um, undergrad sample experience where it's like predominantly uh, female. That's what I've experienced in my uh, undergrad psych samples, but may differ from uh, institution to institution. The other finding they had is that previous psycholo psychology findings replicated. So uh, findings from the psychology, psychological uh, health and well-being literature, and my own study where I replicate something in social psychology, these things replicated. And finally, the scale reliability, so talking psychometrics, the scale reliabilities were similar to the undergraduate samples when they compared them. So uh, I was interested in whether or not uh, sample size would be viable for doing research compared to probably its largest contender, which would be uh, MTurk. So I asked this question, uh, is sample size viable for research? And this is published in Teaching of Psychology. Again, there's a, a link in the uh, reference document. And in this study, the essential idea is that I provided two identical questionnaires to uh, sample size participants and MTurk. I asked them questions on demographics, data quality, uh, or uh, I didn't ask them explicitly about data quality, but data quality, and some psychological characteristics that might have implications for common research. And just to contextualize this, of course, I will speak, be speaking in terms of null hypothesis significance testing. So uh, it's important to mention the sensitivity of these analyses. Uh, so here, for the most part, it's, uh, it, this, uh, analysis, this study was sensitive enough to detect small to medium effects as per Cohen's uh, guidelines, unless otherwise stated. So first off, starting with the demographics, uh, before we saw in the previous research, there was even gender distributions, and this would be a good thing uh, if we're looking for equal gender representation and not some kind of lopsided, uh, lopsided samples, which may be problematic. And it is the case that uh, in our study, we did find at sample size, it was almost, uh, it was basically identical for males and females. Uh, the issue is that there was low non-binary gender representation. This is often not reported at all. I think it is important to uh, report here. But as we found corroborating previous research, male female gender distributions were fairly even. Uh, one thing to note is that the, uh, the sample was largely Caucasian white and from the USA, though I will note here that the countries of residence uh, had some representation from other countries. So half of, about half of the sample was from the US, but uh, the other half was from various, uh, various other uh, countries. Next is the, uh, in terms of income ranges and education, I would say this is far more diverse than uh, what you might observe in a typical kind of undergraduate uh, sample here. Particularly uh, of note would be the representation of people who've only had high school or equivalent education. That's automatically precluded by uh, undergraduate psychology, um, undergraduate psychology classes where they would fall into the bachelor's degree as per uh, instructions. And finally, uh, one thing to note as well is that it is predominantly people of younger ages, which might be expected of uh, Reddit users like myself. So in terms of demographics, it seems quite favorable that there is, a, uh, as we've seen before, a balanced gender distribution and some, uh, some diversity in demographic, uh, demographic characteristics. In terms of data quality, we measured a number of things. The first thing being social, socially desirable responding meaning are they responding in some uh, in a way that make them look favorable, basically. Uh, and here we did find there is this is this tendency is slightly higher for sample size than MTurk. However, you can see just visually here that the difference isn't uh, isn't substantial. And in the grand scheme of like uh, in the grand scheme of the uh, the scale, it isn't a huge, uh, huge thing. It is considerable, but it is worth mentioning here. Uh, the next thing is demand characteristics. Are people guessing the hypotheses and therefore like acting or responding in line with their, uh, in their, with their expectations of these experiments? Here, we didn't see any evidence of any differences, comparatively speaking, between MTurk and sample size. Uh, and again, in the context of the entire scale, it isn't something that we see in general as a huge uh, issue here. Uh, the next thing is, uh, are the participants naive? Like, are the participants familiar with any of the measures that we've been administering to them in the study? And here we uh, saw mixed results in some cases that uh, like sample size would be uh, less familiar than MTurk. We asked participants about each of these scales after we finished them. Are you familiar with this like personality scale? Are you familiar with this scale? Are you familiar with this? And we found that uh, both 
both have high, relatively high levels of scale familiarity. In the context of this, we'd want like few to no people being familiar with these scales. In these cases, it ranges from 20% uh, and up for a lot of the, uh, for most of the cases. And finally, uh, a couple of miscellaneous data quality checks that we had as well here. Uh, first off, attention checks. We had slightly fewer failed on average for sample size in MTurk. Both of them generally, however, performed quite well. Uh, survey completion time. This has been observed before as well that uh, the, the Turkers or the MTurk workers have finished the survey five minutes faster than the sample size participants. Some may the, believe that suggests some kind of uh, like inattention or uh, yeah, some kind of inattention. But this was an exploratory analysis, so I will not go further than, than that. I'd like that to be verified further. And finally, the uh, replicating the reliability findings that we found in uh, previous research. There was no evidence of any of the differences or sample size was actually more reliable in terms of uh, measured in terms of internal consistency, so Chromebox Alpha, uh, compared to MTurk and lab samples. So in general, again, we see that overall uh, the sample size data quality, at least compared to MTurk, seems to be favorable, uh, favorable or comparable. Then finally, psychological characteristics of the participants. So uh, we wanted to ask them, like, why are you participating on, like, why are you doing this? <laughs> why, why are you volunteering on sample size? And for the most part, as we might expect, uh, and has been observed before, uh, sample size participants are more intrinsically motivated to participate than MTurk workers. So you can see here, we asked them, why do you use sample size, the exact title of, uh, of the study? And some uh, we asked them if it's because it's interesting to pass time because it's fun to help with research, et cetera. And in, all in virtually all cases, uh, except for self-knowledge, uh, sample size participants have higher ratings on why they want uh, on agreeing with those reasons for participating than uh, MTurk workers. And we might, uh, not surprisingly, we see that for MTurk workers, money is like the main driving motivation for them by a very, very large margin here. Uh, polit uh, for in terms of political orientation, uh, there are low ratings of social and economic conservatism among sample size participants compared to uh, MTurk workers. Uh, in terms of altruistic personality, one of the other things we measured, uh, there was no difference in, uh, no evidence of a difference in altruism and a slightly higher need for cognition uh, for sample size participants, which is we might expect for that if they're seeking surveys. So in general, uh, I think these characteristics are also important to consider. For example, the political orientation will be very relevant for any kind of like, political science study that people would want to administer on sample size. That may align with uh, knowledge of like Reddit being more, Redditors being more liberal in general. Uh, but these psychological characteristics, characteristics are important to keep in mind for whatever implications they might have for the study. Uh, some of the caveats that we came here. So first off, data collection uh, speed may be a question in the Q&A that is popping up. Uh, it is much slower on Reddit than it is on MTurk. So MTurk, one of the major advantages is its data collection speed. And for us, it took five days for us to collect our entire sample for uh, MTurk whereas it took us almost a month on Reddit. So 27 days of continually reposting the uh, survey link. The other thing is that the intended demographics that we had, uh, as we discovered, cannot be strictly enforced on sample size because anyone can ultimately click the link. And we did have a minor number of exclusions, for example, underage participants, which we were not looking for explicitly in the, in the study. So finally, I wanted to finish off with talking about some of the, like, Kind of 2021 or more current issues and limitations that I ran into myself when I was using sample size and MTurk. For the most part, they encompass both. Uh, so first, uh, there's a list here. First off, I want to go uh, talk about transient sample characteristics, the non-naivety, uh, bots, and random fraudulent responses. If you use Twitter, that was a very hot topic. Uh, guidance on questionnaire design and uh, a very major issue, ethical compensation. So first off, uh, what do I mean by transient sample characteristics? I don't see this mentioned uh, as much as it should be, but uh, sample size uh, especially is an ever-changing um, participant pool. People may never visit sample size again. Pe new people are joining all the time. And uh, even at a very micro level, even on the time of day that you're uh, administering your study, the participants uh, could be liable to change. This is known in MTurk. Um, and so it's important to understand that the samples in sample size and MTurk, they can change depending on the day that you recruit participants, depending on the year, on the long term, it especially matters. 
And because of this, I've always felt that the research on mTurk and sample size is just always ongoing. Uh, I, you shouldn't be uh, putting absolute trust in anything I'm saying here. Uh, you shouldn't be putting trust in any like major meta study that's been done in like 2016, 2017. The data collected for this study itself was collected in around 2018. So these, uh, these participant pools are always continually uh, changing and growing and they need to be always, uh, re research has to always be ongoing about them. And one thing you can do to help this effort is that you should be reporting demographics and the data collection date and times that you had when you were uh, posting your study either on mTurk or sample size. I just wanted to make this thing clear. It doesn't seem to be stated uh, enough. I've read recent studies even in the last like one or two, three years that don't, I don't even know which country the participants are from, it just says mTurk workers. <laughs> so these things are just really important to uh, uh, catalog for the future. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the non-naive participants. So both as, we, as we've seen in the study and as is known, uh, both sample size and mTurk have issues with non-naive participants. One of the measures that I take personally to try to address this or control for it as a covariate, like through demand characteristics, would be looking at having some kind of measure for hypothesis guessing or demand characteristics. It could be a cycle, it could be a scale for demand characteristics. It could be a qualitative or open response question, but I highly recommend not just having a bunch of questions and then saying, thank you, debriefing, whatever, and then finishing off with that. It's, it's very probable that these people who are completing surveys for fun or completing it for profession uh, or for monetary gain uh, have completed so many surveys that they're likely familiar with some variation of whatever survey or experiment that you might be administering. It's important to, again, catalog and document uh, this if you do use these participant pools. I will say again that uh, I will say that cloud research and prolific these alternatives have proposed that uh, they have greater numbers of naive participants because of the ways that they're able to screen their uh, specific participant uh, pools, unlike mTurk and sample size. I think that's important to know, but again, you can visit those uh, sources if you have any curiosities about them. And now the, the hot topic, I would say, if you're on uh, academic Twitter, are bots and just like people randomly answering questions or faking answers. So it was a, a fairly hot topic. I think right after I finished completing this, uh, this uh, my red study on like mTurk versus sample size, that these uh, tweets started coming out about uh, bots and them being a big problem on mTurk. Uh, and it really is a big problem that there are several publications on this talking about how bots are just finishing surveys, like speeding through them and providing just uh, these responses. And they have the incentive to because uh, they need the compensation or they're doing it for the compensation. Uh, participants themselves, maybe they're not malicious, but they may just be answering randomly or trying to do like ballot stuff, uh, complete questionnaires multiple times to receive like multiple forms of compensation. Uh, this uh, at first, I didn't, didn't seem to be something that was super relevant to sample size, which is just completely voluntary and compensation isn't mandatory, but that isn't, I don't find that anymore to be a strong argument on the case that there isn't any kind of bots or other like malicious uh, participation happening on uh, sample size. I think this is something that again, has been understated. I have rarely seen any studies that have taken extensive countermeasures towards fraudulent responses or, uh, or especially bots, the new issue, the most recent issue. Uh, I would say the very minimum that you should be doing is to be implementing attention checks. So you, you've probably seen the classic questions to continue uh, with the survey, press this button or uh, some such. Uh, survey software, if you're using Qualtrics, uh, have uh, more sophisticated built-in features. For example, ballot stuffing so that they're tracking or using cookies or other uh, uh, technological like IDing to uh, restrict duplicate responses. Uh, they also have a anti-bot option, I believe, which is more of a recent, um, recent thing. So they have an algorithm behind the scenes to try to detect bot-like responses and have them fill out like a, a CAPTCHA. Uh, qualitative responses as well. I, again, this could be a double, uh, like a two for one kind of deal where you're not only assessing demand characteristics and uh, checking for hypothesis guessing, but also seeing uh, whether or not it's an actual legitimate person answering the question, or you'll see like just some nonsense uh, typed into these open-ended responses. More sophisticated kind of procedures have also come. For example, there are ways to implement invisible items in surveys that aren't visible to humans, but robots or bots would be uh, answering them. And there are statistical techniques to detect bot-like responses based on certain distributions of responses. Uh, I would recommend seeing Howell 2019, uh, again, in the reference list for a primer on these techniques. 
Uh, there just isn't the scope of time to provide information on this, but I felt it was important for you to know that this is a very a major issue. I've been asked by reviewers about these things, about validation checks and such, and it's important to be aware that uh, bots and just uh, intentive, like random responders, these are a thing and they're quite important to uh, address. Again, cloud research and prolific, some of the advantages they say is that they propose that they screen for bots in their own uh, samples. Uh, next is the questionnaire design, very quick detail, but you'll discover this if you use MTurk or if you've used it before. MTurk charges an extra 20% fee if you have any task that needs 10 or more people. That's basically uh, any study ever, more or less. <laughs> uh, and so one of the most common workarounds for this is to have a batch of uh, instead of having, like, say you want 100 participants, you, uh, uh, instead of having one task or one post for 100 participants, you'd have multiple with nine so that you just meet the little limit. Foster 2015, again, a link in the reference list, provides a guide, a very basic guide on how to do this. Cloud Research says that they automate this function in their toolkit, their MTRIP toolkit. Sample size, you can't control any of these things. That's also important to acknowledge. It's just a link and you let the participant rates come as they go. Finally, the most important issue uh, I think uh, I wanted to finish with is the issue of ethical compensation. So MTurk is uh, one of the benefits is that it can be a, like compensation is up to the researcher. And in the past, people have been just paying people like a few cents to complete surveys. And while uh, that may have been seen as like acceptable beforehand, uh, recent calls, there have been re more recent calls for more uh, larger amounts of compensation. So. For example, Moss recommends $6 an hour. Prolific, uh, aside from MTurk, has a minimum, a mandating minimum of $6.50 an hour. And I would just recommend, like, uh, for whatever ethical arguments may hear, moral arguments, that just a good guideline to start with if the budget is tight. Like I know how it is with undergraduate or graduate grants. They're not, there's not money, a lot of money to go around, but we have uh, we have to be fair to the people who are completing these tasks. Uh, 725 an hour is the federal minimum wage in the US where I believe uh, MTurk is housed. And that's uh, kind of a, a basic guideline that uh, that's followed. Uh, the other reason for uh, giving better compensation is because it leads to better response rates. So one thing you'll uh, one thing to know is that people will be tracking these. There, there are online scrapers that will be tracking tasks and different people who are giving hits. And depending on the pay rates, they'll be rated in a certain way and you'll be given reviews by people. And these things can impact uh, compensation rates as been also observed beforehand. You need to be aware of this. It doesn't really fly anymore to try to pay people two cents to complete like a 30 minute survey. And finally, uh, I would uh, the final issue I wanted to cover is that if you're using mTORC sample size together or with other samples, there's aside from the compensation issue in general, there's an issue of fairness. In that, if you're giving people a sample size questionnaire, uh, but you're also paying and you're asking just for volunteers, but you're paying people on MTurk to take the exact same thing, like what are you supposed to do? I've heard mixed opinions of this, but I've concluded that the best uh, and just the fairest way to go about this and how we did it is that we could provide both pools with equivalent uh, compensation here. Just because they're completing the exact same things at the exact same time, that doesn't seem right to like and not even let people be aware that there is an option for this. So uh, sample size had an equivalent raffle and MTurk workers got a uh, monetary compensation as is available through MTurk. And it is good to note, uh, it's important to note that only half of our sample about even opted into getting compensation for, uh, for their completion. But I wanted to emphasize that uh, this ethical uh, issue here and finish off with it because uh, we are ultimately with sample size dealing with volunteers and with MTurk people who are uh, doing this for, for money, that it's these are things that are important, but we can't really just neglect them, put them off to the side as a, just a section of our methods to say, oh, we paid them like 10 cents or something. I think it's something that deserves more uh, consideration and thought for that. Okay, uh, so that covers everything that I wanted to uh, talk about. Yeah, so thank you very much for having me and I'm happy to answer any uh, questions you might have. Awesome. Thanks so much, Raymond. I really appreciate it. This was a fantastic talk. Um, there was a lot of questions coming in while you were talking and you uh, ended up answering a lot of them in later slides. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get to um, as many of them as I can. But um, if I don't get to your question, uh, please uh, email Raymond and, uh, and you can ask him directly. So here are some, I'm just trying to compile a, a few of the questions here. 
Um, I wonder, do you know the just the general demographics of people who use Reddit? Are there places where you can find that and say this is a pool of mostly young adult people outside of your specific study? Hmm. Uh, I don't have the like exact reference off the top of my hand, but there are, um, I think you can even, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if they're like, uh, academic references off the top of my head. I know you can Google just like straight up, like Reddit demographics. And then there are online scrapers that are tracking like, uh, the different, like most popular, uh, communities or subreddits on Reddit on what kind of people are participating in that. But yeah, right now I don't have off the top of my head, like the exact reference I have for those uh, specific sure. I can add them to the list afterwards, so. Oh, that'd be great, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I've yeah. seen it for um, Facebook and Twitter. You can just look and, and some websites track that. The interesting thing about Reddit is that you don't technically need to have a um, an account, right? Like you could click on the link and do the survey without actually being like a Reddit user. You could be a lurker as they call them, right? Yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm very much a lurker. So <laughs> that's, yeah, that's how it works. And I think the majority of people who, uh, uh, participate are lurkers. Like, uh, we didn't have like 250 people commenting on our like threads. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Cool. That's All right. Question. Thank you. Um, okay. Another question is, um, can you discuss the IRB process that you needed? So maybe specific to your study, but just what do you think IRBs would need to know when using uh, our sample size? Uh, sure. I, I think we actually received an email from somebody who asked and, um, yeah. Uh, so, in the IRB, it, it was actually much more straightforward than I anticipated. Uh, you just described like the procedure and how you're going to be um, like recruiting on sample size. So I would recommend giving like an extensive discussion of this with like references now that there are references on this, because I know there can be some skepticism towards like even like recruiting like snowball sampling off Facebook or something can be a bit iffy sometimes. But uh, I would recommend providing like a description of what sample size is, what it's about, kind of like the same thing I did here, community volunteers, et cetera, et cetera, so that it's clear when you're describing, for example, compensation sections in an IRB or REB application, that it's clear that these are just like pure volunteers and it's not something like MTurk or otherwise they need to compensate them. Uh, otherwise, I didn't have any specific issues with um, sample size. I don't think I had any issues brought at all by any of the committee members for sample size. It was all like other stuff I messed up, so <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so there are a couple questions about using, so when we use Facebook, um, or other social media sites, a lot of times we're recruiting for studies regionally, or we're saying, hey, we're doing a smoking study, and we want people to come in to USC and, you know, um, uh, and, and do something within the lab. So have you seen or have you ever done anything with Reddit where you can recruit people regionally, or maybe even target them and say, this is only going to go out to people who are within Los Angeles area, and then um, any success on actually bringing people into a lab this way? Hmm. Uh, I do know there are, um, I do know there are papers that have done this. So uh, I recommend looking at the, the Shats 2016. And I think some of the references I had on uh, just like previous research on sample size, I believe there have been, uh, there has been work in the past that's looked into like using Reddit as a recruitment tool to bring people like in person. Uh, of course, that wasn't the focus of like what is today. I know it's been done, but I'm not so sure about like the success rates of that. Especially, I imagine now would not be a great time to uh, like try that, of course, with the pandemic. But in the past, I'm not sure how successful it's been. I know it's been done before, though. So it's a possibility. Uh, but from what I remember, it's been a combination of sources that people have recruited from. So it's like they'd say like, oh, we recruited off the Internet and also community and bulletin boards or whatever, stuff like that. But I know it's been done before, for sure. Great. Yeah. And, and then there was a couple of questions, too, just about you know, validating people are who they say they are. This is something that always comes up when we're doing social media recruitment. Um, yeah. It, I mean, besides some of the, some of the techniques that you described, um, you know, I think that Reddit is particularly unique because it is completely anonymous and you've got these lurkers. I mean, are there ways, are there things built into Reddit maybe that can prevent somebody from just going in and clicking a link, you know, a hundred times to just get it and creating a new email and, and getting, uh, getting their compensation, like within Reddit itself. I mean, I know there's a lot of things you can do inside the survey, but within Reddit itself. Uh, within Reddit itself, unfortunately not. Yeah. So the big, the onus is definitely on uh, us as the researchers with whatever platform we're using for experiments or like questionnaires. Uh, again, with the qual like Qualtrics ballot stuffing or bot detection, these are like crucial for sample size, just because 
you don't even need an account to log on to these things. Like you can just um, like use like private browsing or incognito or something. You just like access the page. You don't, actually, you don't even need to do that. You just click the link twice. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to do any of this like fancy stuff that you need to try to cheat like other platforms. Like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it be it's solely reliant on your efforts and uh, whatever platform you're using. Reddit itself was never designed to be like a questionnaire completing kind of platform. Neither was sample size. It's literally just the medium for people to post uh, in yeah. a moderated fashion. Yeah. Yeah. The nice thing about Reddit, though, that you don't see. I mean, I know Facebook has moderators, but you know, not to the extent it seems like that Reddit does, where there's actually people looking at every post. I mean, it's you're just not. Maybe there's just not as many users or there's just not as many posts that go up, but there's just so many different subreddits that, you know, and there's a couple people per subreddit that are able to moderate that. But I mean, it seems like they're on top of it a little bit more than maybe Facebook might be. Yeah, it seems um, uh, it seems so, at least in my experience. I don't know if it was like the actual like Reddit website algorithm itself that gave me the suspension or anything, but I suspect that mm -hmm. it had some kind of uh, something to do with the moderators like as well. So uh, there definitely is like oversight going on here. So um, great. So, you know, and, and on that too, so you talked about the 24 hour rule. Um, does that apply when you're conducting multiple surveys? You know, like let's say you try to post two separate or distinct surveys in the same 24 hour period from the same account. Hmm. Uh, I haven't had to do that before. The, the studies I've done have been just like, uh, like individuals. So they're just by themselves when I was administering them. Uh, I would, uh, I can't remember if there's a if there's a section in that rule about that, but I would say it would like apply. So you really shouldn't be. Uh, again, I, I want to emphasize that these are like volunteers donating their time to help with research, and we uh, I, I wouldn't suggest like posting multiple surveys. You, I think even when I um, accidentally did like a 23 hour versus 24 hour thing, uh, people you also will get backlash from this community saying like you post this like all the time, like stop doing this sort of. <laughs> Like sort of thing, or you'll get like a suspension or something like that. So uh, I would recommend not trying to do concurrent uh, surveys. It's uh, it's also like an overload on like community as well to have multiple like going on. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, okay. So with that, we are out of time. If you have follow up questions, please contact Raymond. He's also on Twitter, as you can see. Um, so I want to thank Raymond Luang once again for his time and for this excellent presentation. Um, you can always view this again if you if you need to. Um, I also just want to draw your attention very briefly to the, the chat. There is a, a link where you can click and give us some feedback as well as Raymond some feedback on, uh, on the talk and some things that you might want to see in the future out of our webinar series. So thank you again, Raymond. Really appreciate it and looking forward to seeing your work in the future. Yep. Thanks for having me. Uh, yep. Feel free to uh, get in touch with me if, any, if you have any like follow-up questions. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks everyone. We'll see you next time. All right. Take care everyone. Mm -hmm.